Hi, my name is Ward. I live in southeastern British Columbia and I have a piece of land that I have plenty of uh, trees that, small trees that I want to remove and I need a, something to do with all that material. I don't want to just burn it or leave it lying around so I'm making biochar with it. So today I'm going to show you the method that I've come up with that I'm currently using to make the charcoal. So this is the way I start the fire. I like to do it without any fuel other than the branches themselves and so I use the smallest bits of branches and I kind of build a nest in the bottom of the cone and put a little piece of birch bark halfway up the nest and then light that and then add small branches to it. So that lights up pretty quick. So in the early stages of the fire, you use the smallest stuff and progressively build up to larger pieces as the fire gets more established. Seems to work best if the pieces are no longer than two thirds of the cone top. Otherwise they get hung up and they stick out the sides. So the cone itself is about four feet in diameter at the top and it's about one foot in diameter at the bottom. And it's welded shut so it holds water. And there is a, a drain pipe with a valve on the bottom and the, the most wonderful addition to this has been the heat shield, which is this outer ring that is uh, two feet wide and circles the kiln. So that, that makes it possible for me to stand here because it's extremely hot in the kiln. And without the heat shield, the heat radiates out quite a bit and it's uncomfortable in this range. So the heat shield is it's gapped around the cone. So there's a three or four inch air gap all the way around the cone. And the, since the cone is welded shut, no oxygen can get in the bottom of the cone itself. It all has to come in the top. So at this point now I've added a, an initial batch of sticks and the, I'm just letting it burn down a little bit and I'll give it a stir to make sure there's nothing uncharred in the bottom of the kiln. Because sometimes if you start with a larger piece gets into the bottom, it, there isn't enough heat by the time you get going to, to char all the way to the bottom. So. so I can reach right down and touch the bottom with this rod. And I just lift lift things off the bottom and any bigger chunks will come up to the surface. Okay, so that's the initial starting of the fire. Get it going and get it all charred in the bottom. So right at the edge of the cone here, you can see where the flame starts and curls in because the, the air is coming up underneath the heat shield and that's where it enters the fire. The, no air can get in at the bottom. So I have lots of small stuff to burn, so I'll just keep burning small stuff for a while. But now you just want to keep adding material to the fire fast enough so that it doesn't turn to ash and slow enough so that it doesn't create an enormous amount of smoke. So if it starts to smoke heavily, 
then you have to back off and let the fire catch up. So I've cut this pile with chainsaw to appropriate lengths for what I'm doing. And uh, you can see the, the sizes of the pieces that I'm using. So this is about as big a piece as I prefer to burn. It takes, it'll burn this but, and a bigger piece, but it just takes longer. And so this I can use in a wood stove instead. So, but all of this, all of this is going in the kiln. Okay, well, I'm just uh, cleaning up around the kiln. I try to keep it tidy so that there's no surprises with embers falling out and catching anything on fire. So there's lots of time to, if the wood is already cut for you before you start, there's lots of time to clean up as you go. Make sure that nothing gets away. One of the reasons I do this is to uh, reduce the amount of smoke that's created. Because people typically burn branches like this in piles and they create an enormous amount of smoke. Here we have at least four months a year where we could potentially be breathing forest fire smoke, so I don't want to add that. So if all of this material were to stay on the ground, within 10 years or so, it would all have turned back into carbon dioxide as it breaks down and decomposes. And this, by burning it like this, it does release quicker, but about 30% of this carbon in all of this material will get turned into the biochar form, which will persist in the soil for hundreds to thousands of years. At this point, I like to give it another stir, just to make sure that I haven't got any big pieces trapped down below. And you can see that it's all turning white, so that's when the charcoal is actually turning to ash. First, the wood will lose any water that it still has in it. And then all the volatile components of the wood will start to gas off. And once that is done and there's only charcoal left, if you were just to leave this to burn, it would all disappear. It would all turn to ash. And you can see the white ash forming. Now the kiln is full enough that I can start adding the larger pieces. And so they need some time to cook. And so I'll try to put in as many of them as I can at this stage. And and they will have air space between them. It's important to arrange the pieces so they're not lying parallel up against each other and they're not lying against the edge of the kiln. Like you don't want pieces to go in there like this because they won't char properly. So they need to be pointing inward somehow away from the, the sheet metal. Now a piece like this is pretty long and so any longer than that and it's going to get complicated to keep it low enough to char. Initially I wanted to 
a bigger kiln just so I could go through more wood faster but I actually like the size of this one because I can I can see in the top So now it's time to give it another stir, or not really a stir, but just I can see right down into the fire and there's places where the it's turning to ash down below because of these larger logs that are hung up on each other. So I'll just basically shake it up a little bit. So that it settles. And then you can see the gas is filling up the bottom of the chamber again so that we're just making charcoal down in the bottom. Having a fire like this, I don't want to be without fire protection. It would be foolish because it takes a lot of water to put this out. And so I will show you my setup. I have a hose that comes from the storage tanks. The hose has a valve and it hooks into the bottom of the kiln right down here. And I can, when I'm ready to put this out, I can open the valves and the kiln will fill from below. And it'll put charcoal out, no question. It's not worth fooling around whether you have some charcoal that's still hot or not because it, if you don't get it all wet, there can be pockets which will burn and it will eventually light the whole thing on fire again. So it's super important to get it put out. Uh, we're past halfway. So I'm just, I guess I've finished adding all the, of the biggest sticks now. From the, pile, from, from the big pile over there, I'm not gonna take any more larger diameter sticks because they take too long to burn. I only have an hour left of burning, maybe less, and I want all the big pieces to be fully charred. So I still have some semi-big pieces and I will use them up next and progressively decrease in size as I get closer to the end so that everything of any thickness has a good time to char. So now the kiln is about two thirds full, I think. And uh, as this burns down, I'll just keep adding smaller pieces to keep the, keep the flames going to use up the gas so that the, flame, the oxygen doesn't get down into the charcoal that we've already made. So you want to keep the fire going right till the end. But I also want all of these pieces that are up to two inches in diameter to be fully charred before this is over. And I'll just give it another stir as the, I see spaces opening up around the outside where there's oxygen getting down in. I'll just shake it up a little bit to, to get it so that it's all immersed in gases. So now I'm finishing the medium sized sticks. So anything much bigger than an inch i'm not going to be putting on now I'll, if i come across one in the pile i'll just throw it back because i want them all to char so now the kiln is almost full of charcoal and it's time to turn on the water so I, by the time I'm finished burning, I want 
it to go out because I don't want to lose the charcoal that I've got. As it turns white and turns to ash, I'm losing charcoal. So we are at the end of the burn and it's time to hook up the hose. into the kiln. So now the bottom of the charcoal pile will start to extinguish and it'll work its way up and it takes about 15 to 20 minutes to get to the top and in the meantime I can finish with this. So anything that is still producing flame at this stage or any stage has still got volatile components in it. It's not finished turning to carbon yet. So what we want to do in the next 15 minutes is make sure that all of these larger pieces that are still in here that are making flame, not all of them are, but the ones that are making a flame, they have to get finished turning to charcoal before we extinguish them. And that's the trick of this. At this point, you don't want to just let all the other stuff turn to ash. At the same time, you want to save, save what you've already made. <clears throat> So the way to do that is to add small stuff over top of the ash. <clears throat> and it will produce its own gases and the flames will take up the gases from the small stuff and protect the charcoal underneath and hopefully make a little more charcoal. So now if you listen closely, you can hear the water underneath coming up behind the flame. And it's boiling off as it puts out the charcoal. So it, it steams the charcoal and opens up the pores, which makes it more ready for the soil to open the pores for the microbes to inhabit. And the, nutrients. There are a lot more bonding sites when you steam it like that. So now we just wait until there's no more flame. And then we know that all the, all the wood is turned to charcoal. Okay, so now there's not much flame left, but there's still flame. So I'll take the, the pieces that are making flame around the edge and kick them up on top in the middle so they can all burn together. And now you can really hear the water. So ideally we want all these pieces, flames, to go out just as the water gets to the top. Okay, so at this point it becomes a trade-off of between getting these last pieces fully charred and the losing the charcoal that you've made. So I'm going to start to stir in the sides because I can hear the water right there. Let that burn for a few more minutes. But if I had a big piece on top and that was all that was left. I wouldn't wait for it. I would just take it off. So now you, the water is right here. So I'll just start to go around the side. Keep letting it burn on top. It will.
Now, now you can see the pieces on top. Their flame is gone, but they're smoking, and so they're still they're still not done. Once all the volatile material is gone, you end up with no smoke and no flame. The charcoal tends to float too, so you can't just fill it up and hope that it'll go out because the top will float on you. And it won't quite go out. I can shut the water off and once I don't hear any more sizzling, that's it. All right, good. We are done. So that is about, uh, that is about 10 times five gallon pails, so 50. 50 gallons of charcoal once it's all crushed. And that probably took two and a half, two and three quarter hours to do. From the time I lit the match to the time we are at now. It's been fun showing you. Okay, so yesterday we did the burn and today I'm going to shovel the kiln out. Uh, last night, after the kiln had sat for a couple hours with the water in it, I drained the water out. So now this is going to be moist but not soaking wet char in here. 